As a practice-based academic and scholar, I have been in this work of fashion and sustainability now for 15 years. Of those, I have spent almost nine now at Parsons, working on sustainability curriculum across the college. In 2013, I was on the team that developed a, a course, Sustainable Systems, which is a required course for all undergraduate students at Parsons, and it's taken by about 1,100 students every year. And um, a couple of years later, I was also on the team that developed the BFA Fashion Design Pathways. So the BFA Fashion Design Program is one of the largest programs at Parsons and one of the oldest. It's over 100 years old and graduates about 300, uh, 300 fashion designers every year. And um, we were able to develop uh, four different pathways, one of which is called the Systems and Society Pathway. So these are fashion design students who focus their fashion design studies in a systems and a societal context. And um, that is also the pathway that I teach in. And, um, and through some of that work, I really realized that education is a future-making activity. Um, students in the educational system today, and that's probably most of you in the audience today, uh, will be among society's most powerful actors in the very near future. Based on the privilege of working as an educator for 15 years now, I see that education has an opportunity for an expanded approach. While we are designing for the near future, we should also be considering the impact of that near future on our grandchildren's generation and beyond. My work as an educator is built on the shoulders of much greater minds than my own. Um, the fashion and sustainability scholar Kate Fletcher, the economists Manfred Maxneef and Kate Rayworth, and uh, the um, design for microutopia scholar John Wood. I will return to each throughout my talk. Today's talk draws from the work that I have done, placing John Wood's work in a fashion context. Um, some of you may have read the manifesto that I wrote for fashion design education recently for the journal Utopian Studies, and um, also connected to that at Parsons for the second year running, I'm currently teaching a, call, a course called Fashioning Microutopias. Um, and all of this work I do expect um, to become the framework for my next book. And I keep saying that publicly so that I actually hold myself to account, because it's being filmed. <laughs> Um, that's a very good way to make plans, <laughs> um, is have somebody film them. Um, as I speak today, I invite you to take on a brief thought experiment. Doing it may require courage, and it certainly requires a healthy dose of imagination. Imagine a world without consumers. Stop relating to yourself as a consumer. The very notion of the consumer was created in the 20th century, and I invite all of us, at least for a moment, to leave the word in the century that it belongs. Consumer does not honor what we are capable of as citizens and as human beings. Today, I invite you to spend a morning with fellow human beings. Yes, I am unapologetically idealist. It is not the only thing that we need, but we will, we will not survive the next century without courageous idealism. Kate Fletcher says, nature's power is in us understanding that it has value that goes beyond its usefulness to us. The literacy this gives us, the knowledge this gives designers, is deeply held and has the potential to shape all our ideas and actions. I ask you to reflect on this for a moment, to really consider that much of non-human life is not useful to us, and yet it arguably has value. And still, we exist on the planet like much of other life is worthless to us. This disposition is a key goal for the various microutopias we create, also reflected in the work of the other Kate, the economist Kate Rayworth. Now, before I chose fashion as my career, I was going to become a conservation biologist um, and focus on birds. While this obviously this not, did not happen, I wouldn't be here if it had happened. Um, birds are part of my daily life and they show up in most of my lectures and this won't be the last one today either. Now, speaking of usefulness, this little pearl, bird called the pulley is useless to us humans. You might see the rings on its legs. Um, so we could argue that it was useful to a few scientists who studied the bird since 1973 when it was first discovered by Western eyes on, on the island of Maui in Hawaii. 
I was born in 1975, so the story of the Puli and mine are about the same age. The difference, however, is that the Puli ceased to exist on November 24, 2004, when the last known individual of the species died. I mentioned the Puli today because last week BirdLife International, um, an international conservation organization, uh, released a study that recommended a status change for this species to move it from critically endangered to extinct. We mostly live and act without giving thought to non-human life, but when we realize the permanent loss that we have caused, we, have, we seem reluctant to close the door and to accept the loss. Now, taking a micro-utopian approach influenced by John Wood, I ask, what would fashion as a system look like if its primary function was to satisfy fundamental human needs, as defined by the Chilean economist Manfred McSniff? What opportunities does this present for us in an educational setting where you are forming your worldviews? Kate Fletcher's post-growth fashion is a micro-utopia with the designable goal to define and describe economic activity by ecological limits. This is among the most challenging design projects of our time, as it is not only the economic structures, that, um, uh, structures and relationships that re require redesigning. Our re ideas of what constitutes well-being, both individually and societally, need recalibrating. The Local Wisdom Project by Kate Fletcher nonetheless points to real, lived examples of well-being that is decoupled from rampant consumption. I deliberately frame the economy as a design problem, one of the most complex design problems of our time, and in this regard, Kate Rayworth is useful in presenting us with a new set of visual tools for approaching the economy as a design project. Rayworth's thesis is simple. The global economy must operate between the two boundaries that you see here. The outer boundary is the planet's ecological ceiling. When we overshoot it, we, we destabilize planetary systems. The inner boundary is minimum level of human well-being, not survival, well-being. If we look at the current global economy, uh, we very quickly see that we exist outside both of these two boundaries. Fashion design by provisioning warm and water repellent clothing can be argued to respond reasonably well uh, to people's need for protection from the elements. The economic system that we have in, uh, has ensured that in developed economies, like here in Finland like, and like in the US where I live, there is an excess of clothing to protect us from the cold and the rain, with a growing stream of our cast, cast offs overwhelming developing economies. Currently, the primary objective of the fashion system in the dominant economic system is not to respond to fundamental human needs, but rather to fulfill an economic imperative of growth, resulting, resulting in unsustainable levels of cons overconsumption. I invite you to reflect how does fashion, including fashion use, repress, tolerate or stimulate opportunities for groups or individuals to fulfill their needs? What becomes possible if this very question becomes part of the foundation of fashion? Now, here are some figures to paint you a picture of the economic present that highlights the short-term thinking in fashion business and in society more generally. You may be familiar with, with some or all of these figures, and I, I argue that this is part of the... Um, primary design problem that we currently have in fashion. One recent study estimated that globally we are now producing approximately 150 billion garments every year. There are 7.6 billion of us on this planet and growing. Um, so that works out to be approximately 19 or 20 garments per person per year. However, as Elizabeth Klein points out in her book Overdressed, um, in the United States we buy on average 68 garments per person per year. Many of you would have seen the news uh, earlier this year of H&M uh, having $4.3 billion worth of unsold inventory sitting in warehouses. You might also know that last year H&M was one of the brands, alongside Bestseller and others, caught incinerating new unworn clothes in Denmark. These issues are by no means limited to one brand. Um, this is a set of global systemic issues. 
One study published two years ago estimated that of all clothing produced, so of those 150 billion garments, a third is sold at full retail price, a third is sold at a discount, and a third is not sold at all. That third is either landfilled or incinerated. The accuracy of that study has been questioned, and, um, and I'm not sure that it is that high, but even if it were 1%, 1% 1 of 150 billion garments being landfilled or incinerated without ever being worn, we're still talking about millions of garments. And I will assert that it is more than 1%. It is, uh, uh, based on what I've seen over the years, I'm guessing somewhere between 5 and 10% of the total. The sole purpose of those garments is to spur economic activity, to spur growth. These figures reveal that fashion's most pressing challenges cannot be solved through conventional fashion design. Designing a slightly different garment, for example, a t-shirt made from organic cotton instead of conventionally grown cotton, will not solve this. Um, it will not solve the industry's reliance on overconsumption to thrive economically. As well as H&M, I'm sure most of you saw the news earlier this year, it was only a few months ago, um, of Burberry burning brand new clothing. And I acknowledged that last week Burberry made an announcement that they're now going to stop doing this. And um, it's amazing that that took two months to come up with that statement. Um, to hear that Burberry has burnt nearly $40 million worth of goods in the past year alone, and much more over the past five, may be shocking to you. It certainly was shocking to people outside of fashion. Um, I also know a lot of people in fashion who just shrugged their shoulders. I was kind of one of them because I have known about this happening for a long, long time. Um, is it, nonetheless, I want to ask, is it shocking for us to hear that in fashion we burn millions of garments each year that have never been warm, worn? Brand new garments, some of which might be organic cotton or recycled polyester or made in a fair trade factory and we incinerate them before someone even wears them. Consider this, we are now at peak stuff. Recently a journalist asked me about the Burberry case, why do we do this? Why do we incinerate brand new clothing? The simple answer is, there is so much of it around that we don't know where to put it anymore, other than to a landfill or up a chimney at an incinerator. We no longer know what to do with our stuff, individually or collectively. Have most of you heard of the uh, KonMari method? So the KonMari method is an approach to decluttering um, by the author Marie Kondo. So this, I would argue, is one symptom of peak stuff, that we now need a book to get rid of our stuff. Um, think of incineration and what you see here as part of a societal KonMari. We declutter by burning brand new stuff. No incremental change will solve this issue. We need a whole systems transformation, and that is where design for microutopias is one part of um, the solutions. Imagination is key. If we choose that burning brand new clothing is actually undesirable and something that we want to stop doing, then we will need a completely new system. The reason is that the underlying mechanisms and goals of the current system will logically lead to this to this excess and this waste. That is what happens when we pursue growth at any cost, when growth is the primary goal, and when the accumulation of wealth is the primary goal of the system. I do want to qualify something at this point. To talk about sustainability and to talk about um, new futures by design is a privilege, and we ought to acknowledge that privilege. For someone who is financially insecure or someone whose day-to-day -day life is dominated by just surviving, of course accumulation of wealth is a, a goal. That is not who I'm talking about here today. I want to make this clear. I am not out to critique a person or even a country where people might struggle to eat on a daily basis. They want their economy to grow and we cannot fault them for that. That is, who, that is not who I'm talking about today. I am talking about the Walton family who own the Walmart complex or, 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 or con um, um, the Walmart company in the US. I would like to ask them, what is your concept of enough? I'm talking about the Person family who own H&M or, or a large portion of H&M. 
and I would like to ask them, what does enough look like for you? And I'm talking about the Ortega family who own Indidex and Zara. I would like to ask them, what is your idea of enough, and to, po to what point will you grow to? I'd like to ask these questions because there are real, concrete, planetary boundaries to growth, limits to growth that we must acknowledge. And we must acknowledge them now, in our time, not in some abstract point in the future. Poorly, the bird I showed you earlier, is one of thousands of species that we are now losing each decade. The rate of loss is such that we don't even know anymore what we're losing. Now, in my work, I reimagine education as a site to conceive fashion as a system of satisfiers of fundamental human needs in a post-growth society. By virtue of being future-making, education, I would argue, is a fruitful site for this micro-utopian work. John Wood distinguishes micro-utopia from utopia by the former being more tentative, temporary, pluralized, or truncated. I will add that microutopia are more specific and local, and as the name implies, um, smaller in scale. Wood outlines these five steps for achieving microutopia. One, breaking through one's own psychological barrier regarding what is possible and attainable. And often that is the hardest step, actually dealing with the barriers in your own mind about what is actually possible. Two, co-imagining the dream in a shareable form. Three, checking that the dream is in fact something that is desirable. And then four, assessing the attainability of the dream. So that's where we actually check, is this feasible? But we don't stop at step one just because we think something is un uh, uh, impossible. And then step number five, sharing the task of producing and sharing the dream. And by the way, this usage of the word dream and dreaming is not mine. That is John Woods, and it's something that we ought to uh, notice. Um, the way that he uses language is not how language is often used in conventional design briefs. Um, no matter who you are and no matter what you end up doing in life, um, I will argue imagination is vital. Exercise your imagination just like you would exercise your body. Um, it actually takes work to keep it nimble. I also invite you to embrace a diversity of scales, something I alluded to earlier. Often small-scale innovation is dismissed and we only want to hear of large-scale solutions. Small executed by many can be immensely powerful. I invite you to get out of the dichotomy of small versus large. We actually need both. We need a diversity of scales of solutions. What follows are some examples of small and medium scale solutions. My intention is not to say that these are the ones that we need to replicate, but rather I argue that the examples that I now show you are all examples that we can learn something from. I also want to say with the first two examples that design for micro-utopians in fashion doesn't necessarily mean really expensive clothes, um, just because the first two examples are really expensive clothes. Um, I made that mistake in, an, in a lecture a few months ago where people left thinking that I was there to talk about making just really <laughs> expensive clothes, and that was um, um, not what I had intended to speak about, so I just want to make it clear. Design for microutopias in fashion doesn't necessarily mean really expensive. Um, nonetheless, it's worth ex uh, acknowledging that um, due to various factors, we rarely these days actually pay the real price of clothing uh, when we buy, buy clothing in a store. Now, my suggestion is to look at this as a spectrum, as a diverse landscape, and avoid any kind of binary opposition like I just said before. The two examples now, first Friends of Light and then Mononic, um, arrive at very high prices because of extreme labor, um, uh, extreme amounts of labor, um, all of which is also executed in, uh, executed in New York State, uh, where labor costs are high, just like they would be here in Finland. Um, I do invite you to ask with both of these examples, what is handwork worth, um, and particularly handwork done by women? 
Friends of Light is a Hudson Valley based weaving cooperative made up of Pascal Gutson, Mae Colburn, Jesse Hyatt, and Nadia Yaron. In my PhD, I referred to this kind of approach as fully fashioned weaving, the weaving of garment components to shape. This eliminates the off cut waste created during the dominant cut and sew methods of clothing manufacture. It is human scale weaving in a very literal sense, weaving that responds to the human body, weaving pieces and shapes to fit the body. Friends of Light are influenced by the four salvage cloths of the Incas from South America. They are whole and complete through weaving, not through cutting and sewing. Friends of Light have adopted a version of this principle in their approach to weaving their jackets. The weft ends are spun into each other so that no knots or visible joints uh, exist in the cloth. Friends of Light source their yarns from local Hudson Valley fiber producers. Um, each jacket is woven to order, and these jackets are extraordinary in their craftsmanship. Um, very precise armholes and set in sleeves are woven to exact shape. Um, and you see a sleeve being woven here. Once the pieces are completed, they are hand sewn together into a jacket for the client, and each of these jackets takes approximately 150 hours to complete, which is why um, they sell at a very high price. Yoshiyuki Minami of Mononik, like the Friends of Light, is a creator who values nature in his work. Minami is a Japanese artist and designer based in Brooklyn, New York, and like the Friends of Light, he worked with local fiber producers, um, albeit uh, in his case he works with fiber producers all the way up to some of the southern states because cotton, like in the example that you see here, is a major part of his work, but nonetheless he knows the farms uh, that the cotton fiber comes from. Um, he knows the entire supply chain for every garment he designs and makes. And like the Friends of Light, all of these are made to order for the customer. From fiber to yarn to dye plants to metal hardware, everything is documented on the brand website. So you can literally go onto his website and find out where everything comes from. Everything is given value and everyone is given value. He also weaves garments to shape with some differences in the methods to Friends of Light. Uh, in, in Yoshi's or um, in Mononik's methods, uh, there is some warp waste which he collects and, and actually the embellishment that you see on the jacket is waste from a previous project. Um, there is no waste going to landfill from his studio. Um, and to me, what's really interesting about his work that time begins to overlap in his work in that these um, projects from different times start to come together in, in some garments like the one that you see here. And actually that manifesto that you saw in the first slide, um, it was, it's a manifesto making, that's a collaboration that I'm working on uh, with, with Yoshi. Um, he wove the, it's about six meters of organic cotton cloth. We wrote the manifesto together and I'm now hand cross stitching it. It's about uh, 300 hours of stitching, so um, it will be ready sometime next year with the caveat that I said the same thing about a year ago. So <laughs> um, it's not a, pro a project to be rushed. Um, going up in scale a little bit, um, I do want to uh, highlight Eileen Fisher. And, and I get that this has been in the media um, uh, a fair bit, which is a very good thing. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's worth talking about because Eileen Fisher, the company, took on a micro-utopian project in 2015 when they declared their 2020 vision that by 2020, within a five-year time span, they would be a fully sustainable fashion company. They did not know exactly how to get there, yet they were going to give it their everything to give it a, uh, to try. It takes a particular kind of leadership to do this in a company, and that's where Eileen Fisher, the woman um, who you see um, here, is really to be commended. Um, what you see here are three research fellows working with Eileen. Um, they worked on a year-long project, um, and basically they were given a task of addressing the second-hand clothing that was accumulating in the Eileen Fisher warehouses. Since 2009, Eileen Fisher has been collecting garments back from their customers. And they sort it all, they clean it, and then they resell it um, if they can. And most of, it, most of what they get back, they are able to resell. And since 2009, they've accepted back over a million garments from their customers. 
Um, nonetheless, some of these garments have holes or stains in them that mean that they can't be resold, and those are the ones that have over time accumulated in their warehouse. And those are the garments that were assigned to these three young women, um, all of whom I had the pleasure of teaching uh, at, uh, during their time at Parsons. Um, upon graduation, they were hired for a year um, to deal with this. And what they came up with was this system of um, upcycling um, damaged clothing into new clothing, and this is one of the production lines that you see. I, I call it a production line, but it really needs to be acknowledged that this is still very much like a craft practice. Even though the company is able to do uh, runs of up to four, 400 garments at a time, um, compared to the sort of usual operation, this is essentially um, a craft practice. And um, a few months ago, I had to kind of defend the company uh, on Facebook because someone was questioning the price of um, one of these remade garments uh, because the retail price is essentially the same as the regular Eileen Fisher garments. And, um, and it's not until you actually see the operation, and I visited the factory several times, uh, including with my students, um, you actually see the full labor that goes into sorting, uh, washing, then inspecting, and, um, and then the actual taking apart and remaking. Um, the labor costs are immense, and yet uh, the company has now been doing this for two years, and the, the resound line is profitable. And, and Carmen, who is uh, on the right-hand side, she's actually still working there. Uh, Teslin and, and Lucy have moved on to other things, but the company actually made Carmen uh, into a permanent position, and she, this is how she designs. She gets a spreadsheet that tells her what's in the warehouse. So, for example, 800 pairs of black linen pants, and she will then design around that, from that, which is a very different way of designing fashion to how I learned to design fashion, for example. Um, and you can also see that Basically, anything that's outside of the white sheets is actually becomes waste, and that was my first question when I visited the factory because I saw one of these production lines happening. I said, "Carmen, what happens to what happens to the stuff around? Cause there's quite a lot of it, actually." <laughs> and um, and I was fearing to hear that she would say like, "We burn it or we landfill it or whatever," but um, her face actually lit up, and she took my hand and took me to the next room where they have three textile artists who use the scrap to make homewares and, um, and they use needle felting and a few other techniques to actually combine the scraps into much bigger pieces and then do things like um, wall hangings and cushions and so forth. And, and um, that work has actually been exhibited globally now. Um, so this actually opened up a whole new opportunity for the company also to expand their, not just their product range, but I would say their aesthetic because um, it, it has brought a whole new visual language to the company. The, um, I mean, of course, it's all subjective, but I would say that the work that is being made from the, from the scraps is actually quite beautiful. Um, you can actually see the investment of time um, in, in the visual um, nature of the, of the textiles. Um, and I will say that if any of you are visiting New York, they do actually take tours of this facility, so you can actually visit them. You just need to set it up in advance, but they, they have had other companies, their competitors, come and see how they are able to do this because they want more people to do this across the industry. Now, I just want to briefly talk about zero waste fashion design, which I'm sure many of you know was the PhD, uh, was my PhD research. Uh, zero waste fashion design is design where um, no fabric is wasted in in the making of the garments, and um, and in itself, I would say it's a utopian idea. But then to actually make it real in practice um, is a micro utopian project. Um, the amount of waste that that is created on average is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. And if you think back to those 150 billion garments that we are making every year, 10 to 15 percent of the fabric used to make them is actually a lot of fabric. And, um, and so this is something that we do need to do more of. And I show this example because I would say that this, this was a kind of a micro-utopian curricular project um, at the 
uh, Lahti or Lahden Muotoilu Institute, uh, where these two students uh, graduated from, and um, and basically a couple of the teaching staff there, they decided to implement zero waste fashion design into their curriculum starting in 2011. Uh, basically using a couple of articles that they found online, written by me and written by Holly McQuillan. Um, and and I, I still think that, that that's something that all educators can learn from, because the teachers actually had no idea how to do it, but that didn't stop them from doing it. Um, and I think that's the kind of approach that we need a lot more of. We spend so much time worrying about whether something is going to be successful or not that we actually don't end up doing a lot of the th ideas that we have. We often are completely crippled by a fear of failure. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on these. I do want to say it's just um, the way that the images are laid out might make it look like that. That was done in like one afternoon. Um, with one coffee break. This is several weeks of work. Um, to get from the top left to the bottom right is um, probably seven or eight weeks of work. Um, that's the final layout and, um, and that's the garments. So there's a jacket, a top and a pair of shorts that resulted from, from that project. Now this is another Microutopian project made real. Um, so, uh, somewhat on a larger scale, even though the garment itself is actually quite small. Um, and most of you would be familiar with the brand The North Face. Uh, certainly if you ever come to New York in the winter, um, I, I think just about every third person is wearing a North Face jacket on the subway. Um, this hat is made from what is known as climate beneficial wool. Um, and it, Climate Beneficial Wool is one of the projects of an organization called Fibershed. Um, and um, Fibershed, I think, is a really exciting example of um, a micro-utopian design project in action. Fibershed was established by Rebecca Burgess in 2010. And um, it is a network of farmers, uh, scientists and others. And um, at least for right now, Fibershed primarily focuses on animal fibers and primarily wool, um, like you saw in the hat. And, um, and their aim is to develop and reinforce regional regenerative fiber systems and local economies. Um, the Climate Beneficial Wool Initiative that the hat is made with um, guides farmers in adopting practices that transform wool production into a carbon sequestering activity with the potential of creating garments with a negative carbon footprint. Now imagine this expanded to all farming, including our food farming. And these, by the way, are principles that can be adopted across the board. Because the soil has the capacity to, uh, to be a substantial carbon sink, and, um, and really all of farming has the capacity to facilitate this. Um, Fibershed successfully connects textile and fashion design with agriculture, science and economics by engaging a diversity of stakeholders across the fields. The mix of disciplines is both an opportunity and a challenge for design education um, because traditionally design education is very disciplinary focused. Um, I know that Alto has done a lot of work to break down the barriers and so has Parsons, so I think both Alta and Parsons are sort of leading the way in, in bringing people from different disciplines together. Um, but certainly when we come to the industry space, we still have a lot of work to do. And that's where I think Fibershed is one example. Again, like I said earlier, it's not to say that we need to replicate this exactly as is, but there is something to be learned. Because Fibershed, for example, they do work very closely with scientists to measure the amount of carbon that individual farms are putting back into the soil. So they will measure the soil before and after implementation. Um, and this is a process that takes several years. Um, but they, they now have uh, quite a lot of hard science to back up the claims that they're making with this work. I'm coming to, to sort of the final section of the talk and, and um, I'm actually going to conclude with a return to non-human life. 
um, on the planet. Uh, life that has value, whether it's useful to us or not, if you think back to that quote from Kate Fletcher. In the film Racing Extinction, Dr. Jane Goodall holds a mirror to us from the future. In 200 years, people will look back on this particular period and say to themselves, how did those people at that time, that is us, how did those people at that time just allow these amazing creatures to vanish? Uh, later in the film, she does urge us, without hope, people fall into apathy. There is still a lot left that's worth fighting for. Um, and unfortunately, I'm showing you something that we probably can no longer fight for. Um, unfortunately, it, I think it's too late. Um, the animal that you see here is, is known as the vaquita porpoise. Uh, it's a small porpoise found in the Gulf of California in Mexico. In November 2016, 30 individuals were estimated to be left. And that was down from 60 only a year earlier. So the population literally halved in one year. Um, and the reason is these are being caught as bycatch of, um, of fishing for a particular species of fish. Um, and, um, and where it gets even more heartbreaking is the fish isn't actually eaten. There's only one part, uh, its swim bladder, that is sold uh, for traditional medicine in China for a very high price. So um, this is actually uh, being wiped out um, for something completely unrelated. Um, the most recent estimate earlier this year had 12 animals left. And this may be the year that is actually the end of this species. In a recent article, Ben Kolfarb gives us the word used to describe the last one of a species. It is an endling. Be with that word for a moment, a word of the Anthropocene, an endling. One of those 12 is the endling um, of the vaquita porpoise. Kolfarb writes, in its 11th hour, the vaquita, like the baiji before it, has become a core celebre elevated from anonymity just in time for us to remark on its likely passing. I don't say or show these things for us to be depressed, although I do think it is healthy and vital for us to feel grief about these things. And I will say that extinction actually makes me cry. Um, I cried last week just before my lecture to my students at Parsons because an hour before class I read the article that uh, published the results of that study that recommended um, that the poorly be classified as extinct, and it was actually one of eight species. Um, it wasn't the only one. I show these because I believe we need to remember daily everything that we're losing, everything that we are replacing with us, and everything that we are making disappear with what we call development and what we call progress. It is easy to watch Blue Planet 2 and be shocked for a day and then carry on as usual the next day. Um, we must remember, uh, first we grieve and then we act. The American design philosopher John Ehrenfeld says, possibility may be the most powerful word in our language because it enables humans to visualize and strive for a future that is neither available in the present or nor may have existed in the past. Operation Migration is a project that embodies possibility in design. It arose from st someone standing in what is possible, not, is not what is probable or likely. The whooping crane is a North American bird. In the early 1940s, it was down to 15 individuals. Um, while that one remaining wild population, which migrates through, uh, from northern Canada to the uh, coast of Texas, has now grown to over 400 birds, there is a risk of them being wiped out by a single oil spill on the uh, Gulf of Mexico coast. Um, all of the um, nearly now 500 birds uh, winter in this very concentrated area and it really just could be one oil spill and, and that's the end. So because of that, um, for the last 40 years there have been four separate attempts to reintroduce these cranes to other parts of North America. Um, the challenge is that cranes, like many other large birds like swans and geese, uh, cranes learn the migration routes from their parents. So when a particular local population dies out, that knowledge of the migration path dies out as well. Um, and so this was a challenge for the early uh, reintroduction efforts because even though the 
cranes survived wherever they were released, they didn't migrate. And, um, and there were other kinds of problems as well. When another crane species was used as a foster parent, they tried to then breed with that species rather than with their own. Um, now, I show this because this is also what I would call a kind of a micro-utopian project, albeit outside of fashion and, and, and design as we traditionally understand it. Um, there was a Canadian artist and innovator, uh, Bo um, Bill Lishman, um, who had taught Can uh, Canada geese um, to follow him on one of these ultralights. You basically imprint the birds when they hatch to think that you're their parent and they will follow you pretty much anywhere. Um, and so he had this crazy idea, if I can do it with geese, maybe we can do it with hooping cranes as well. And, and they did. Um, so in 2001, um, the first class, uh, as they became known, um, of nine birds um, were guided from Wisconsin in the Midwest to Florida, a total distance, distance of about 1,200 miles, um, which I think is about 1,700 kilometers. Um, and the process is this, and just listen to me explain this because it sounds absolutely insane. Um, so the cranes hatch in the spring like they would, but they hatch in incubators. Um, and um, the first thing they see is this kind of a sleeve that has been made to look like a crane head. Inside that sleeve is a human hand that's giving them food. Like it's got like little pincers and it's taking food from a bowl and giving it to the baby crane. So in that moment, the baby crane thinks that that sleeve is its parent. Um, later, when they grow a little bit, they actually start to... Um, be socialized with the ultralight, which is obviously enormous in comparison to these tiny birds. Um, but they don't have any people around. So the, the only people who are there, and you can't really see it in here, but the people who are actually operating the machinery, they're in these white capes with the one sleeve that looks like a crane head. And the baby cranes still think that that thing is their parent. And they still think it's their parent when that person climbs into the ultralight and takes off. And um, and they still think that that is their parent when when this whole thing flies 1,200 miles from Wisconsin to Florida, and um, and when you actually write it out on paper like this is what we're gonna do, it sounds absolutely insane, um, and yet they did it and they did it for 15 years. Um, they stopped the um, ultralight led migrations in 2015, so just three years ago. Um, they are still releasing cranes into the same area because the cranes now, um, that there's so many of the, there's over a hundred hooping cranes migrating from um, Florida to, um, from Wisconsin to South. Not all of them go to Florida anymore. Some of them decided that they liked Alabama better. Some of them like Indiana better. Um, but that nonetheless, they're always returning to Wisconsin. And, um, and this method is no lo this is incredibly expensive as you can imagine um but it is no longer necessary and and like i said there's over a hundred of these birds now migrating back and forth and this year five um birds were born um uh, on the various uh marshlands uh, where they nest so there's still questions whether this will actually become a viable population um but if it does it will be the first of of the attempts to to do so and this is certainly a method that can probably be replicated elsewhere and in fact it has been replicated in in europe with a um with a species of ibis that was wiped out from europe but survived in in um in in morocco uh, where there's now a small number of ibises uh, migrating from austria to italy and back um using this method So I'll finish with this quote uh, from John Wood and a, uh, and a bit more on the word possibility. So John Wood in his book says, um, there is no logical reason why we shouldn't be able to design miracles. And I think the example of Operation Migration is one such miracle. 
Possibility is a highly potent word. Within it resides the power to create new realms. We need to create a system of education that trains young people with the ability to imagine realms unconstrained by their own past experiences and knowledge. And as educators, we must ferociously moderate our own experiences and knowledge when we critique the new realms and the new possibilities that you create within them. Educators, including myself, should be guardians of possibility and guardians of the possibility of possibility. Design, including fashion design, needs to design design itself while concurrently designing the world at large, including designing new garments. Critical systems analysis combined with unconstrained, courageous imagination facilitates reimagining fashion systems. Garments designed within these new fashion systems ought to embody courageous imagination. We have an excess of unimaginative fashion already. The human imagination will be one of our most powerful assets in flourishing through the next five centuries. Wisdom is the ability to create new futures without constraints, to let the human imagination do what is naturally able to do. Of course, any project will have its real concrete constraints, and they emerge at various points of planning, design and implementation. Using hypothetical constraints, however, to not even entertain a possibility borders on irresponsible and exemplifies the kind of cynicism that John Wood warns us against, the kind that has us acting or not acting opposite to how we know we should be acting. Absolutely, we must learn from the past, but we must always move forward in a mode of creation. Nostalgia is benign in small doses, dangerous as a way to live. Create a future that embodies possibility instead of a future you know you can have. What we know is not a problem until we allow it to limit the future we dare to imagine. And with that, I invite you to create from nothing, literally, and every day. And that's where I will leave it. Thank you very much.